said they can't make it, but um, I'm sure the uh, uh, the recording will be uh, available later this afternoon. So are you just what I'll do, speak, Steve, or are yeah, you yeah, I'll ask? just I'll just say hi. To, I'll just ha I'll just say hi okay. to people. Then I'll pass to um, to you. Do you want me to pass directly to you, Steve, to to sort of give your view, or do you want me to talk yeah. to Hen pass yeah, to Henry yeah. first? Well, it's you up, up to you. Fine. I'm very happy to kick off, but it's up to you. That's fine. Okay, so I'll start admitting all, and then uh, we'll. Um, uh, some people uh, admit everyone. There we go. So we're admitting people. So there we go. Good morning, Jim. Good morning, David. Good morning, Alan. Good morning, Mike. Good morning, Eve. Good morning, Chris. Good morning, Peter. More people are coming in. I'll admit people. If you've just joined, if you could uh, go on mute, please. That would be great. Just to iron out any background noise. Good morning, Maggie. Good morning, Ian. Uh, good morning, Mark. Um, there's more people joining. Let's admit all again. Good morning, good morning, morning. Morning, Wilson. Uh, morning, Alan. John, morning, JQ. Good morning, Jim. Um, okay, and more people joining. If you've just joined, if you could go on mute. Billy, if you could go on mute, that would be great, please. Thank you. Um, just to cut out any background noise. Thanks, Billy. That's very kind of you. Uh, and morning, Joseph. If you could go on mute, please, that would be great. Um, just to leave Steve, um, Sir Steve, to be able to talk, that'd be great. And more people joining. So uh, give us 30 seconds. Admit all. There we go. That's fine. Uh, if you've just joined, if you could go on mute, please, that'd be great. Good morning, um, Shanaz. Good morning. Mayor, good morning, Ben. Uh, it's now 10.32. And I, OK, right. So um, I think we'll start now, if that's all right, uh, Steve. So um, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to this week's Pension Play Pen Coffee Morning. Um, delighted to introduce uh, Steve Webb, um, who uh, has got some commentary and some thoughts on last night's uh, dinner at Mansion House. Um, so first admittance, uh, my my bad. Uh, Steve wasn't there, uh, according to popular. Um, he he wishes he were there, but obviously his invite got lost in the post. Um, so many apologies, he wasn't there, but um, I'm sure uh, he's got a lot to say about it. Thanks everyone for joining. Um, the, what we usually say on Pension Playpen is, um, if you would like to ask a question or make a statement or be um, challenging, then please raise a hand. We do like interaction. Um, we will also open up the chat room. And if you'd like to ask uh, Steve a question or indeed make a, make a point, you can make it in the chat room if you wish. But uh, Henry, Tapper and I will probably expose you and ask you to unmute and um, ask your question face to face. So without any further ado, um, number, number one, we are uh, recording. So can we have a thumbs up? Everybody's happy to be recorded. Uh, Mike, Eve, thank you. Mark, thank you. And uh, thanks you, Peter. Thank you, Sarah. So without any further ado, I'll pass over to Sir Steve, who will um, give us an update on the dinner that he didn't attend. So there we go. <laughs> yes. I hear the fish course was very good. Oh, there we are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks, Steve. And good morning, everybody. Um, I realise that you could all be reading 50 different government documents this morning. So thank you for making the sacrifice to uh, to join this session. Um, what uh, Normally, if I came on a session, uh, you'd be appalled if I hadn't read absolutely everything. So I want to start with a confession. I haven't read absolutely everything yet. So one of the things I hope we can do on this is if you've read a doc the document you were most interested in and spotted something, do share it. Uh, so hopefully at the end of the hour, everybody on the call between us will have all read all the documents and somebody will be able to say something interesting about each one. So I'm just going to flag a couple, but I think it's easy with such a torrent of Treasury and DWP and other announcements to lose sight of the big picture of what's going on here. And I think it's worth just stepping back for a second and saying, well, what what is the government trying to do? And the best analogy I can think of is, you know, uh, you're in a, a school playground and the child comes in and they've just had the latest toy for their birthday and you haven't got one and you just wish you were like them. Well, that's government pensions policy in a nutshell, but substitute Australia and Canada for the child with the shiny toy. 
In other words, the government has looked around the world and said, if only, if only we were like Australia and we had a handful of super funds with vast amounts of money, if only we were like Canada, who appear to be able to invest in British infrastructure, unlike British pension schemes, if only, if only. And therefore, the whole drive is about scale, it's about consolidation, it's about pooling, so you'll see some of the CDC stuff and so on. So that's that's the big picture. So when we get into the weeds of all of this, it's just worth remembering that is the big picture. If, if there is a question, the answer is always bigger is better. That's, 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 that's where they're coming from. Um, so what did we get? Well, what was quite funny is by the time the Chancellor stood up, a whole bunch of stuff had already been trailed. So the big mansion house compact was a set of largely master trusts and insurers committing that by 2030, five percent of their assets will be invested in unlisted securities. Now, when I've discussed these <clears throat> options and policies with government, I've said, well, hang on, it's unlisted security here, it's private equity over here, it's venture capital here, it's infrastructure and liquids over here. And, you know, th they it depends on the context what what it is that they think is good that we don't have enough of but in the context of the five percent pledge it's unlisted equities and the 50 billion number they're quoting is based on a five percent share of a market which is currently 500 billion so workplace dc roughly 500 billion estimated to be a trillion by 2030 so the idea is that five percent of trillion 50 billion quid now worth saying this is not a this is not a guarantee they might not achieve it. If they can't find things to invest in, they won't get to 5%. Uh, they're not obliged to. If the 5% dips below 5%, there's no legal mechanism to force them to get it back up. So it's an aspiration. But it's an interesting contrast, I think, with the opposition party. So the Labour Party have said, yeah, we want pension money spent for good as well, but we're going to mandate it. We're going to require 5% to be spent on, you know, insert your favourite uh, topic here. Um, so I think that's a, an interesting difference between perhaps a conservative approach of, of nudges and using convening power and getting people to make make offers as against a more sort of dirigiste approach perhaps that the opposition would take. But 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 it's worth saying we may get a change of government perhaps in the next 18 months, but an awful lot of what we're talking about today will not change in my view. You know, there'll be a lot of continuity because if you are a government or an opposition, you feel you've taxed more or less as far as you can go. You feel you've borrowed more or less as far as you can go. You are going to want the pension money to be doing some good. So hence the DC stuff there. Um, likewise, they want consolidation in the DC world. So they're, they're talking about tightening up the master trust authorization framework so that small master trust would be forced to merge. They really, really want small DC schemes more generally to, to consolidate. And that's, again, part of the VFM framework. Um, and they want CDC. So the big step forward today is preparing the way for multi-employer CDC. Uh, and a journalist said to me this morning, oh, well, that'll take forever. But the beauty, of course, now is we have the primary legislation, the 2021 Pension Schemes Act, which means that multi-employer CDC, all being well, can proceed without another act of parliament. And in parliamentary terms, that's incredibly important important because if you think about the next 18 months to a general election we've got one what I still want to call Queen's speech not King's speech probably in October I would guess that will set out legislation for the next 12 months up to the election well if you're the government coming into an election you're going to be far more interested in legislating on stopping the boats I believe is the phrase uh, getting inflation down well you know your five pledges whatever they are it's not going to be multi-employer collective DC contribution, you know, it's, that's not what it's going to be about. So anything that doesn't need an act of parliament has got a much better chance. So we got the CDC stuff. We got super funds. Hurrah, you say. Um, that was a 2018 consultation. But the 2018 consultation isn't the oldest consultation they've responded to today. There's a 2017 consultation they finally dealt with today, but the 2018 one on super funds. So now there's going to be a legislative framework, note in my comments about the King's speech, but there's going to be a legislative framework. So we don't just have the TPR interim framework for super funds. There'll be a primary legislative framework so people will know where they stand. Fair to say the, the super fund world is happy this morning. Um, the 2017 review is the automatic enrolment one. And again, we've got a bit more detail today about a consultation in the autumn. And the idea there is that um, they, they legislate to make the 8% apply from the first pound instead of from a 6,240 floor. And they bring in 18 year olds rather than 22 year olds. Um, that will be consultation. There'll then be no doubt 
legislation, there'll then be a phase in period. So it will be several years before that's all fully implemented. But that's that's on the horizon as well. The other thing that wasn't trailed, but we've got is small pots. And so they were consulting on pot followers member as against a default consolidator and they've opted for default consolidator. Um, the reason for that, it's got the word consolidator in it. In other words, my comments at the start, you know, big, it's got to be big. That's what we want. And so their reasoning is you change job, you leave behind a small pot. Where is it going to go? Well, it could go to the scheme you're currently with. And then their document kind of says, yes, but the scheme you're currently with could be a bit rubbish. Now, you might well say, well, what are we doing allowing people to be in workplace pensions that are a bit rubbish in the first place? But hey, um, whereas if you have auto consolidation to a separate consolidator, then you can really regulate the teeth out of that. And you can be darn sure it's, you know, big value for money, well regulated, etc. So that's what they're going to do. Um, now, um, lots of jargon here. So it's the multiple default consolidator model. So there won't just be one. Uh, there can't be many because it wouldn't really be consolidation if you had many. So there will be few, but not one. Um, and there'll be a regulatory regime for them. So the big insurers, the master trusts can presumably compete to be on the short list of short list of uh, approved default consolidators. And then my understanding is they're going to adopt a carousel approach, which means that the punter, the first time they have a deferred pot, gets randomly allocated to one of the default consolidators and then all subsequent deferred pots go to that default consolidator. Now, I have heard, but I haven't had a chance to check that they're drawing the line at a thousand pounds initially. So the thousand pounds would be very, very, very small deferred pots. Now, I uh, I'm a bit of a heretic on this. I think the threshold should be 20,000, not 1,000. But the problem with 1,000 is, of course, even if you consolidate all these kind of, you know, 700 pound pots, most people's pots, deferred pots, there'll be a hell of a lot over a thousand quid, won't there? I mean, if you earn 20,000, which used to be the average wage of someone on auto enrollment, it's gone up now, I imagine, and you pay 8% of a band of earnings of 14,000, that's a thousand quid. So all you have to do is do a year with a company and you've got a pot above the default consolidation limit. So it seems to me that if this is where they stop, uh, you know, just teeny weeny pots going into a default consolidator, then the consolidated pots are going to be tiny. I mean, how many 700 pots does it take to boil a kettle? I mean, you know, you consolidate five 700 pound pots and you end up with three and a half thousand. Well, big deal. Meanwhile, you reach retirement with, you know, nine pots because you work for more than a year for mine firms. So I've kind of uh, not, you know, I think fine, let's get the infrastructure in place for this, but let's not stop at a thousand for goodness sake. Um, so that's quick thought on small, on small pots. Um, there's an interesting set of stuff about trustees because they, 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 they sit in government asking themselves, why don't these pension schemes invest like Australia and Canada? Well, for one reason, Australia and Canada have got big DC schemes, and a lot of ours are DB, but parking that. Um, why don't they invest like Australia? And one of their theories is that trustees and the people who advise them are risk averse, too risk averse. So they're consulting on culture of trustees and, you know, are they just, just innately wary people? And do we need swashbuckling trustees? If that's not a contradiction in terms, but you know this sense of is the culture right? Um, but they also they also have this sense that trustees don't know what they're doing, that trustees don't have the expertise. You know they don't they don't know how to invest in illiquids or private equity or venture capital or whatever it is. And maybe we need just just cleverer trustees. And of course, what they seem to forget is particularly in a world of professional trustees. The people who are on trust bodies are often on multiple trusts. They've got experience across DB and DC. They're part of trustee firms who've got that experience as well. So the idea they don't just don't understand these investments or don't don't look at them seems ridiculous. So I think you have to, but there is a consultation on trusteeship. So if you care about that, you might want to respond to that. But there's also an issue about supply because, of course, it's all very well saying, go on trustees, give it a go. But what if there's nothing to invest in? So the British Business Bank is being asked to come up with some ideas about vehicles. You know, do we need new things that pension funds can safely invest in that are a bit more growthy, a bit more risky, etc., uh, where the due diligence has perhaps been done rather more? So the British Business Bank is out today consulting and will be coming up with some ideas there.
I'm going to raise one more topic, Steve, and then I see lots of questions in the chat, which is great. But I'm going to raise one more topic, which is a kind of hobby horse of, of mine and my colleagues at LCP, which is D DB. So we've been saying all along, fine, half a trillion quid in workplace DC, but there's well over a trillion quid in DB. So what if you could get a small percentage of that DB money better invested? And I know my colleague um, Steve Ott has been on Pension Playpen talking about this, but the DWP of this morning put out what's called in the nuance of these things, a call for evidence rather than a consultation, which means they're one step further away from making a decision. But basically they are looking at um, the role of the PPF in helping DB schemes to invest for growth. And there's kind of three ideas on the table. So the first is this sort of Tony Blair Institute idea. And the Tony Blair Institute talk about taking the smallest four and a half thousand schemes, DB schemes, which is an interesting way of putting it, the smallest four and a half thousand schemes, physically moving their assets into the PPF. And then the, because the PPF is you know, big and invest for growth and all the rest of it, um, you, you'd get some scale. So um, the Tony Blair Institute document seems to regard moving money from a DB pension scheme into the PPF as a bit like transferring from your sole account to your current account. You know, you just press a button and move the money. I don't think they appreciate that, you know, PPF assessment normally takes up to two years. Uh, and the idea that you move four and a half thousand schemes across seems bizarre to me. And of course, if what you're really bothered about is getting DB money productively invested while protecting the members, why would you start with the smallest schemes? You know, the faff of trying to move a 20 million scheme across to the PPF and how much extra productive investment you get off the back of that relative to starting with a big scheme seems odd to me. But that's one of the options that I'm consulting on. The second one, and they don't mention any of these by name, but it's pretty obvious what they are, is the idea that we've been promoting, which is you start with the big schemes, you start with the well-funded schemes, and you try to provide a 100% PPF underpin. So you don't move the assets, but you allow on an opt-in basis of well-funded schemes, the sponsor to pay a super levy to cover that last slice. And the beauty of that is the trustees job done. The trustees then know that the members are going to get their pensions paid because there's a 100% underpin. Then they are more relaxed about the scheme investing, not everything on the 230 hey doc, but just a bit more for growth. The sort of thing we would have thought was normal five years ago, let's say. And if that all goes well, then you end up with growing surpluses. Now, of course, the sponsor has little interest in growing surpluses at the moment because they can't get their hands on them. But what if once you'd reached full funding plus a buffer, you could then extract what we're calling super surpluses. So that way the company benefits there's a consultation question this morning about the tax treatment of that extracted surplus, which would be 35% at the moment, but I think they will probably move to taxing at the corporation tax rate. So that's that's a possible change. So the extracted surplus could then be used for the current employees, for wages, for pensions, for investment in the business, for dividends, whatever the company wanted. But the beauty of all of that is you've got a bigger cake and then you can have a very pleasant argument about who gets which slice. So the DB members might get some discretionary increases, which is another sweetener for the trustees. You might be able to have a DC section of a DB trust so you can move some money over to DC that way. There's a thousand possibilities, but why wouldn't you regard a pension as an asset, not as a burden, and sweat it a bit more and then let everyone share in the growth? So that's that's our idea that they're consulting on. We think there'll be a decision in the autumn statement, so that's not very far away. You'll have seen the deadline for these consultations is September, uh, so uh, we're not allowed summer holidays, I think. And the last one in that document, and then in a minute I'll hand back to you, Steve and Henry, is um, the PPF as a public sector consolidator. So there is an argument that says we've got too many small DB schemes in particular. Is there a case for a public sector consolidator? And if so, presumably the PPF, um, and, and they are sort of asking open questions about, well, you know, how does that compare with the super fund regime, for example? Um, how well funded do these schemes have to be? You know, if a scheme is small and underfunded, can it just be dumped on the PPF or does the sponsor have to pay something extra, in which case you haven't severed the link with the sponsor anyway? You know, so these are all kind of live ideas, but I think the big change today and yesterday is that the government's finally spotted there's a trillion plus in DB and actually if they want to get serious about productive finance, ignoring two thirds of all pension assets seems a bit of a strange way to go about it. So um, 
as I'm no longer a politician and have to keep my promises, I will stop there, Steve. But I hope that's given people enough to chew on. Um, but would love to hear, I see there's some hands up, but would love to hear as well, anybody who's actually read documents I haven't referred to, spotted stuff I've missed. Hopefully by the end of it, we'll all be slightly better brief than we were at the start. But um, back to you, Henry and Steve. Yeah, well, thank, thank you very, very much, much, Steve. That's great. Uh, there is one consultation response which you haven't mentioned. There may be more, but the one that <laughs> yeah, I've the read, one. <laughs> the one that I've read is the one on uh, VFM. Yeah. And uh, there are a couple of new things in that which are worth noting. One of which is there's a much greater emphasis on the employer being told that the scheme is failing. So uh, multi-employer schemes like Nest, a million employers or however many they've got in there now, all of those employers, if Nest was failing, would get a little notice saying your scheme is in special measures. If it doesn't shape up next year, it's going to be closed down. Uh, Nest is probably the most likely, not the most likely of the schemes to get such a notice, but you can imagine some of the smaller master trusts quaking in their boots at the force of getting uh, two or three hundred thousand employers um, sent a, a note saying that they're a failing, <laughs> failing uh, master trust. What, what kind of communications problems is that going to create? The second thing in the consolidation paper, which is interesting, is they've moved from net performance to gross performance, meaning that uh, you'll be able to report exactly what it is that your fund managers are saying they've produced for you. And then your cost and charges estimate will be knocked off that so that you can work out what the true impact of uh, performance is. Um, complicated, um, not the solution which uh, Age Wage was looking for, um, but a different solution reflecting to some extent the fact that they don't want to double count charges once one as a test in itself and the other as part of the performance test. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. But it does look that by and large the VFM consultation is as it was when it was put out by the DWP in February. OK, Henry, thanks. Well, we've got a hand raised for a long time by Christine. Uh, Christine, do you want to ask a question of Steve or um, unmute? Or maybe Christine, I don't know, no, are you I've still got, there? I've got you. Yeah, can you hear me? Oh, we can hear you, Christine. Yeah, go on. You want to ask a question or make a statement? Yeah. No, or maybe not. <laughs> Christine, can we can you can you test your mic? No, okay. So let's move on to um Lord Davies of Brixton. Uh, Lord Davies, you want to uh, unmute and ask a question? Yes, I um, I uh, I sort of apologise for the title. Um, I I can't be faff to change it, uh, <laughs> depending on what which which meeting I'm in. So uh, think of me for these purposes as Bryn Davis, a long-standing commentator on pensions. Um, I, automatic involved. Thanks very much, Steve, for the um, for. For the summer it's very very useful um uh as you say it's going to be a busy summer my question relates to automatic enrollment uh I, I i'm not very clear about your position on the extension of automatic enrollment first we've got a bill on on friday they're actually yep. getting the legislation to to remove the lel and, and to take it down to 18. So I don't think they need any more legislation for that. Maybe there's other bits they want to change, but but that seems to be going ahead. I, I guess it will need regulations as well and so on. Um, I thought I saw you especially some doubts about the value of that in overall terms, uh, but then I Googled you and automatic enrollment and everything I found uh, seems to suggest you were in favour of it. Have you did did I imagine the doubts that you expressed, <laughs> or have you my, uh, my, my have you had a debate with yourself? My position is so nuanced. <laughs> yeah. No, so so I think it's the right next step. I guess my two my two doubts were a it should have been done five years ago. We we really have wasted five years, I think. And I think the second is even when all of this has gone through, which is probably about three years away, I would think, because they're not going to do it in a single leap. Oh. Even then, we're only at eight percent of the whole of earnings, and everyone on this call doesn't think. I suspect that's that's enough. So I suppose it's not that I think it's a bad. I think it's a perfectly good thing to do. 
Um, bear in mind, there's quite a lot of people who are already on 8% from the first pound or whatever from the first pound to whom this will make no difference at all. You know, so I think it's a good thing. It's uh, particularly for companies where they're trying to get away with the legal minimum. You know, for someone on 12,000 a year, this more or less doubles what they're paying in. So, you know, I think it has to be a good thing. I just feel like it's the next incremental step, but we've got an awfully long way to go. And the next thing I would do, Bryn, which perhaps you, you would find favour of, is I'd level up from five plus three to five plus five. You know, I can't see any reason why employers should pay less than employees. Yeah, good good answer. Good answer. Um, Christine, your, your hand is still raised. I don't know if you can unmute, but... Um... Yes, I'm, I'm unmuted now. Can you hear ah, me? Ah, there we go. Hi, Christine, we can hear you. Yeah, go on. Hi, uh, oh, good. I just wanted to ask Steve Webb. Hi, Steve. Hi, yeah. Uh... Hi, yeah. Um, so why is your advice so effective? Why is your way the right way? And what's the basis for your recommendation? Thank you. Yeah, it's good. Good challenge. Um, I think there's been a general feeling for a long time that the de-risking of DB may have gone too far. That huge amounts of money are in the company pension scheme equivalent of a cash ISA. You know, we've got this vast amount of money that's been put aside at great cost over the years, and what are we doing with it now? Virtually nothing. And a lot of people have said, oh, you know, they ought to ease off on the gas. They ought to let people invest a bit more for growth. But nobody's ever until now, I think, answered the question, yes, but what about the downside risk? What about the risk to members? How do we overcome the trustees' proper concern that if you take more investment risk, the pensions might not get paid? And having slogged our guts out for 20 odd years to get to this generally very, very good funding position, we don't want to throw it all away, do we? And, and, and so what I hope our version comes up with is a solution that provides comfort to the trustee and the member which is paying for full insurance full ppf insurance in this case that then allows the trustees to invest in the scheme to invest a bit more for growth so we, i think we've provided that missing link of how do you invest for growth without taking you know putting members benefits at risk and i think what we've said to the treasury is if you're serious about productive finance there are two things you do the first is you start with the big schemes not the small schemes because that's where all the money is and that's what our proposal does and the second is you don't first of all spend years moving money from pot a to pot b you know from the scheme to the ppf before anything really changes crack on with where the money is now change the incentives and crack on so you know we found that it takes people a while to get what we're talking about because we've been in such a different mindset for so long. But by the time they've chewed on it, they think, actually, what's, what's wrong with that? You know, um, and as I said, of course, schemes will go on buying out. Some schemes will just be past the point of no return. They'll have made their decision and that's fine. But for those who are perhaps planning to run on anyway, why not get some more growth that benefits, you know, the DB members, the DC members, the company and the wider economy? So that's that's our proposition, Christine. I don't know if that's helpful. Yeah, it's helpful. Um, I just wonder, since you advise Rishi and the Conservative Party, do you think there's a conflict of interest now? <laughs> um, I'll talk to anybody, Christine. <laughs> I mean, joking aside, so, you know, we've been and described our, propos our ideas to the Labour Party. Uh -huh. uh, I even talk to some of my Lib Dem colleagues occasionally. So basically anybody yeah. who's within reaching, you know, so I don't, you know, uh, my voting patterns haven't changed, Christine, let's put it like that. But, you know, if if any government will put good ideas into practice, I'm willing to talk to them. That's that's great. That's a good idea, having an open <laughs> mind. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for your question, Christine. Uh, Simon Males, you've got your hand up. Do you want to ask, um, make a point or ask a question, Simon? Yeah, it's a question, really. Thank you very much indeed. And I uh, really appreciate the discussion so far. Um, I, I work, and just for transparency, I work at a private markets manager. The question actually relates to the assets that are increasingly and swiftly transferring to the pension risk transfer providers, to the buyout uh, providers. And Steve, of course, you know, the money is not disappearing. Those members' assets are really just switching from uh, DB trustee uh, to uh, one of the oligopoly of the buyout providers. Given that they're already, you know, whether it's legal in general or Rothesse or PIC or, you know, the other buyout providers do allocate to private markets um, and some to private equity, how will the rules in relation to solvency <coughs> two and the treatment of this in terms of matching adjustment and um, uh, solvency capital ratio, how can they be improved or evolved to encourage the insurers to, to allocate more? 
No, it's a good question. And, and it's surprising how little evidence has been published on, OK, the money moves from a DB pension scheme to an insurer. What does that do to the investment mix? And we've had a good look at this because obviously I think certainly we're one of the largest advisors on DB, so we, on DB transfer, risk transfer. So we've we've asked all of the people we deal with to tell us how they then invest the money. And we've got detailed data on that. And I think there's a couple of things that are quite striking. The first, as you know, is they get rid of the gilts pretty much. You know, the insurers on the whole want to hold other things than gilts. So the Treasury is one of the Chancellor, I should have said, the Chancellor had three golden rules for assessing all this stuff. And one of them was impact on the gilts market. And they are worried that with the bank selling gilts, uh, they, they still want to make sure there's plenty of people buying gilts. And of course, at the point of, de of uh, doing a buyout, a lot of gilts get sold. I don't think the Treasury would really quite grasp that. So actually our proposition that keeps the money invested in DB with a, sh with a share to gilts helps on that point. I think the second point is what you raised is okay, the money transfers to the insurer, but the insurer has then got to stand behind decades and decades of contractual pension promises, so can't take a punt, uh, nor should they be able to. And so the argument is, transferring to an insurer, although there are things insurers do which are more growth focused, as you say, the money that sits behind a DB pension buyout is still very low risk, low return on the whole, is not fundamentally, you know, small allocations of the sort that you describe, but it's going in things like, I mean, I think we saw chunks of allocation to equity release mortgages, to corporate bonds, you know, it's not, I hesitate to use the word sexy because Henry will tell me off, but it's not the sort of stuff that gets the Chancellor out of bed in the morning on the whole. So, you know, yes, you may be right that insurers will do more of the sort of thing you're talking about than DB schemes, though there's no reason in our world why DB schemes shouldn't do a reasonable allocation to what you're talking about, because once member benefits are underpinned, they can take more investment risk. But just finally on your question about solvency regime, I mean, so obviously it's assumed that solvency to two will become solvency GB or whatever they're going to call it. Um, I'm just a bit nervous about going too far and relaxing all of that. You know, we are taking a huge punt in the buyout market. You know, we really are shifting vast amounts of money over to the insurers who in turn, some of them are reinsuring in some cases to the same place. I'm not sure, you know, the bank are already starting to worry about systemic risk and so on. So actually I think a mixed economy where the insurers have their share, where ongoing DB schemes have their share, where the super funds are part of the mix, where the CDC, I think that diversity is probably good for the economy as a whole. But I, I, fair to say, Simon, I'm not a, a guru on the finer points of uh, solvency measures and definitions, as may have been apparent from my answer. Thanks, Steve, and thank you, Simon. Um, can yeah, I just uh, jump in? Henry, on, you can jump in, yeah, please yeah, do. Yeah, Willis Taz Watson did some good research on the actual disposition of the assets, which is almost as good, I'm sure, as the LCP research, but they did publish it. And I don't think there's any private equity in there. I, I think that there's a lot of corporate bonds. And yeah. I think there's a lot of infrastructure and uh, social housing and all kinds of stuff you can get invested in. I think the big thing that someone like Eddie Truer would say is, look, if you put your money in the super fund, you really are getting your money invested in productive capital. If you put your money in with these insurance companies, you get some kind of watered down version of that, but you don't really get the kind of growth. So it's over with me and I'll make a real go of it and your members will get a lot more by way of discretionary increases and so on or st st stick it with a, a boring old insurance company and, and that's just about it for the members. Uh, maybe a bit of an oversimplification of the argument, but that seems to be where, where just about where we're at. If we're going to have pension super funds, I mean, they've got to be different from insurance companies, haven't they? Yeah. Okay, cheers, Henry. Uh, Martin Tingle, you've made a, quite a few <coughs> comments in the chat. Do you want to maybe uh, decloak Martin and um, make your points or? Um... Yeah, no, I'm happy to do so. I mean, gosh, thanks. Um, there was a lot in there and there's been a lot released this morning. Um, I mean, uh, there was a, a comment and I think the wording in the um, press releases and so forth about talking about the, the culture of the trustees being risk averse. Um, I think that's perhaps a little unfair. I think the trustees have been operating and steered towards a risk averse um, environment where TPR has been encouraging trustees to really lock down and make the accrued benefits for the members safe. 
and that inevitably leads to a risk averse investment policy. In fact, they were mooting not that long ago that they would tell you how the assets should be invested. Um, so that language uh, was interesting. Um, on the small pots thing, you asked Steve about the thousand pound limit. I mean, my reading on that was that it's a stopgap, that it was a starting point. Um, I think they said in the consultation response that they didn't see it as an end. They'd like to have made it higher, but they want to start with the thousand because that's going to have a big impact pretty quickly. Um, so I probably got to pause there. See if you want to. See yeah, no, thank, thank, thanks for that, Martin. I mean, I take the point about a thousand pound being a starting point, um, but my sense is that <laughs> I don't know whether it's vested interest, but certainly it's been a strong message of keep this limit very low. So it right, might go to two thousand or something like that. But you know you're still not going to get the kind of consolidation, you know. So let me give an example. People, you know, read the weekend finance pages. It's all about, you know, your asset allocation of your DC pot and, you know, uh, strategy through retirement and all the rest of it. Well, all of that is incredibly difficult. If your money's scattered across several pots and maybe a bit of legacy DB, and then you've got a spouse or partner who's also got different pots, trying to rationalise all this is nigh on impossible. Uh, so unless you get auto consolidation at scale, you know, big, big single pots rather than lots and lots of middling pots it seems to me you've not really done the job you've you've read the industry of loss making tiny pots of silly pots if you like but you haven't really achieved proper consolidation i should just say there's a giveaway paragraph in the minister's foreword to the small pots document which sets out what she wants to do which is pot for life so it's pretty clear now she will have been reshuffled by the time this happens so it doesn't matter but um what she would like to do is have at the start of your work journey you choose a provider and that's your provider for your entire life as in the australian model um and i can see the attraction of that because you know it puts the consumer in control and all the rest of it in competition and so on but i think it's a terrible idea um, first of all, the punter has got no rational basis for choosing. You know, you start your workplace journey, presumably at 18 or 21 or 22 or something. How on earth do you pick a provider? Do you pick the one with the best TV ads, the best app, the best phone service, the slick, slickest logo? I mean, you know, how do you choose? And of course, the providers will be bees around a honeypot because the providers won't be interested in low earners. They'll want the top people in the business. So, you know, I, I think about when I work for Royal London and Royal London would would provide a pension for the whole workforce and the low earners would be loss making subsidised by the high earners. So the fee income from the high earners enabled Royal London to provide a pension to the low earners. And, you know, there was cross subsidy going on. Well, in a member chooses pot scenario, what would happen is all the advertising, all the promotion would be at the top earners as a result of which they'd go out of the workplace scheme. What's left would then be unviable for a sort of, you know, for the rest. So I used to joke that, you know, if we went down that route, everyone would end up either with Hargreaves, Lansdowne or Nest. You know, so that didn't seem to me like to any. So the minister would quite like this. But as I say, sadly, she's so good at her job, she will be promoted within a few months time, I suspect. Yeah, and uh, before we come on to Andrew Stalker, um, I used to run a master trust, as some of you will know, and I think uh, it needs to appeal. If you're going to be one of these um, consolidate some random cons carousel, you mentioned, Steve. I did. Carousel. Yeah. Um, you know, the limit of a thousand is tough because <coughs> if you've also got to deal with a cap of 0.75, and again, that might need reviewing, you've then got the levies, you know, there are FCA levies on GPP and there are TPR levies on the occupational side for master trusts. Well, some of those can be ATP or a pound. Well, you're only talking about five pounds for a 700 pound pot. So uh, there's got to be a different um, levy regime uh, if you want to be a consolidator in that space, because, you know, that's a, a huge chunk of your income gone in a levy. Um, so, um, there does need to be a different framework if, if if interest needs to be sparked at the lower end of the of the, of the, of the market so yeah i imagine right, Steve, yeah. no it's a really interesting point i imagine <clears throat> providers would see it as a loss leader i mean i yeah. think they would lose money early on wouldn't they but they'd want to be one of the favored ones and and of course the the marketing advantage is that you say to your customers look you know the government only lets three people be con pension consolidated and we're one of them so we must be good so Fair, 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 fair comment. Absolutely. Uh, Andrew Stalker, do you want to uh, unmute and ask your question? Yeah, sure. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll unrate as well. Uh, it's more to do responding to the uh, S2 discussion. Um, again, I won't put myself up as a, as a guru in this area, but equities and particularly private equities are, are very harshly treated. Off the top of my head, I'm thinking 30 or 40 percent discounts. Uh, on the other hand, things with what they call the contractual cash flows, which all the kind of stuff you're talking about. So uh, yeah, up to infra, they uh, they have the benefit of what's called matching adjustments, which have their own problems. In fact, uh, they have rather bizarre characteristics that when the market goes bad and thinks people default, it makes them cheaper. But uh, yeah, um, yeah, I, I just thought I'd sort of put that in place. Uh, as I, yeah, I'm not an expert on this, but we have dealt with quite a few companies in that area. Yeah, no, that's really helpful, Andrew. Thank you for that. And I think I think that's right. And that's partly why I was perhaps a bit harsh on them when I said, you know, this measure over here is about unlisted equities. This measure over here is about venture capital. This one's about infrastructure. And, you know, you probably do need different players in the market concentrating on different parts of the overall goal. I think that's probably right. So I don't think you're going to get a lot of private equity off the back of insurers setting money aside to pay for uh, DB promises. Absolutely. I mean, obviously, uh, yeah, this is where the, hopefully the, uh, the the pension consolidation market will go. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. OK, uh, we've got another hand right. Uh, JQ, uh, I think you're next. Are you? Um, do you want to unmute JQ? I uh, have. Thank you. Can you hear me? OK, yeah, yes, I've, got can, yeah. I've got I mean, this biggest, the biggest, better point. I mean, Equal Life were big. AIG were the biggest insurer in the world. RBS was the biggest bank in the world and Lehman were quite sizable as well. So I'm a, this big is better point is a, is a, is a dynamic that I think uh, has had a bit of Kool-Aid and it maybe needs to, to be redressed. Um, we created systemic risk back in the day because of big is better. The US were very concerned about, I think it was 20 firms that could hit, um, damage the global economy. Um, the PPF as a pseudo almost free insurer of a last resort has got all sorts of fascinating and and um, serious ch serious challenges. Um, and, it, and, and in terms of the, the DBDC mix, I mean, UK PLC needs a mixture of equity and debt to function properly. And to a great degree, if the pension funds that are investing in bonds and gilts and the insurers that are investing in primarily bonds and infrastructure debt and so on, they're providing capital, but debt style capital. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's OK. Um, you certainly can't I mean to get PE money into into insurers. If you've done any modelling at all on long dated liabilities and the impact of interest rate movements, it's a no, no. It's it's it's, it's there's a harsh treatment for a very, very good reason. Um, your, your, your your solvency ratios go through the floor very quickly if interest rates move against you. Um, I guess that's that's all, all, all I've really got to say. I'm just I'm I'm I'm, sh I'm I'm encouraged by the vast range of things that are coming out, but there are some some issues that I think we need a lot more discussion on. Thanks, John. I mean, the the point about big is beautiful is is, is understood. I mean, I guess. That what tends to happen is they look at the incredibly fragmented nature of, for example, the DB market, where I think it's something like the bottom 80 percent of 10 percent of the assets or something, something very, very skewed. And they sort of say this is ridiculous. We've got all these tiny DB schemes. But, you know, um, the I mean, David Fairs, who was at the regulator, who's jo joined us recently, says, you know, that's that's where the bodies are buried. You know, that's where the poor governance is and so on. But then what you target, I think, is is poor governance. And if, you know, so, for example, the TPR recently did some research, didn't they, where they said that, you know, the, the smaller DC schemes, there was a whole bunch who just hadn't bothered to comply with, with the latest ruling on sub 100 million schemes. Um, and you kind of think, well, it's one thing saying we should be allowed to continue to exist. But if you don't literally don't follow the regulations, that's kind of you've got to worry about the member interest, I think, at that point. So so I think you can use standards to drive drive out poor practice in the tail i think that's certainly but but just saying you know i, I suppose the, the other paradox of course is why would a uk pension scheme invest heavily in the uk 
I mean, you know, um, it seems to me that's that's kind of not the opposite of diversification, isn't it? You know, if your sponsor in the DB world, if your sponsor's geared to the UK economy and the UK economy turns down and you've also chosen to invest the fund assets heavily in UK economy, that's 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 the opposite of what you'd want to do. So it shouldn't surprise the government, I think, that, you know, even if these funds get bigger, a good chunk of the extra money won't be going into the UK economy. And that's just kind of how it is, I think. I'm not sure there's a, a fix on that. Yeah, Thank good point, want. Steve. Absolutely. Uh, are, you, is that, are you happy with that answer, JQ? And yeah, yeah. I, I mean, certainly the. I mean, the the other challenge with big is beautiful. Then, the, then for my discussions with any PE houses, small ticket sizes for many of them, they won't go out of bed for less than a couple of hundred million. And and that's the result. The bigger you get, the harder it is to get that trickle down money to. Depending on what the thought process is, is it tech? Is it infrastructure? Is it um, ESG? It, it's it's uh, there'll be many many stories within that as to what people think. The answer is going to be as you started with Steve. So I do wonder um, whether the, the, this banner headline needs it just needs a lot more work. Yeah, yeah, yeah fair comment. Uh, Alan Chaplin, you've got a hand raised if you want to ask a question, Alan. Uh, yeah, it wasn't really a question. It was just on Steve's point about the sort of pot for life piece. If we actually think the employer is better than the individual to choose, you could still have the pot for life with employer choosing. Employers still have a default, and when you join your first employer, you join their their default. And when you move, your choice is new employer's default or your existing one. Uh, yeah, you could do that. So I you mean, could do that. It's still, I think, the power of inertia is such, though. Yeah. Uh, that. It's a bit of a lottery who your first employer is, isn't it? You know, your first employer chooses well or badly and you're kind of a bit stuck, you know, yes, with that. But, you know, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a smaller group than the entire population. But yes, yeah. I think that's a problem of you need decent measures to be able to compare the pension schemes rather than, I, th yeah. I think, trying to teach a million employers or 20 million people how yes. to choose a pension scheme is impossible. We need a proper comparison of pension schemes and then whoever is responsible for choosing actually has some reliable measure. Yeah, and I think the other thing as well is if you have an individual member choosing pot for life, is the cost implications of that? Because uh, certainly in Australia, my understanding is one of the things that causes costs to be higher than they need to be is just the marketing. Because, you know, if your yep. your business model depends on attracting individuals, particularly young individuals, presumably, um, you spend a hell of a lot on marketing, which is all kind of dead money compared with just the employer choosing for everybody. So I know it sounds, you know, for a good liberal like me to talk about paternalistic employers choosing for their workforce doesn't kind of sound right. But if the punt, you know, the punter has no informed basis for choosing. They can't make sense of the performance data, the cost data, the investment strategy. They just, you know, and we're seeing this in the consolidation market for individual DC. You know, we can think of providers are doing really well because they're slick, because they've got good marketing, they've got good customer service and all that kind of stuff, good apps. Um, are they the best of the consumer? Not necessarily, you know. Yeah. Okay. Maggie. Thank, yeah, Maggie, Maggie good hand raised, Maggie. Yeah. Hi, uh, hi Steve, thank you for this morning. Um, I was just looking at the bit where they said they want to encourage CDC and I just thought well that appears to be the extent of the actions in this particular document <laughs> or and less than something this morning I haven't seen and you know encouraging CDC is all very well but it's um, a nightmare to work through the regulations to set it up and there is no incentive for an employer to do it. It might be brilliant for members, but who is going to actually take the effort to set it up and to get it going? And what's the government going to do to help? Yeah. No, uh, so we're expecting the regulations on multi-employer CDC um, shortly. Uh, so that they obviously weren't ready for today, but I think uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see them in, in the autumn with a view because because again, the minister, the current minister, I have to keep saying, don't I, um, is very, very keen. Uh, I think she sees CDC also in decumulation, which I'll come back to. Uh, and so I wouldn't be astonished to see regs in the autumn pass through Parliament by Christmas, that kind of, I think they are very keen. And as I mentioned, you know, without revealing too many state secrets, we've got a couple of different clients who would like to set up industry-wide or multi-employer CDC. In both cases, they're coming out of DB. So for the employer, it's I just want to get out of DB, but I do want to, you know, I'm still a relatively paternalistic employer. I want to offer something good. 
you know, but without a sort of open blank check. So I think that's the obvious initial space. But then if CDC starts to, you know, get scale, do well, you know, if I've chosen individual DC and I can choose collective DC at no particularly increased cost, then that might happen. But I think somebody's got to get it started first. I mentioned decumulation and I haven't covered that. Um, there is also a document on decumulation and it's consulting on whether there should be a default. So I've been on a bit of a, Bryn might uh, suggest my position is nuanced on this one, but um, you know, I am now of the view that there should be a default journey. If say you saved in a master trust, the idea that you just then got a pot and a bit of an investment pathway nudge from the FCA and then you're on your own, I don't think he's right. So they're consulting on whether every master trust would have to offer a default post retirement journey. Uh, again, they quite like retirement only CDC to be in the mix, but I think we're some distance away from that. But I think, it, you know, coming soon to a master trust near you, I think, is a, a default post retirement journey. Thanks. I mean, Maggie's point is really uh, interesting because there's a balance between regulation and bureaucracy and red tape. And I think that's Maggie's point is, well, you know, if it's a hard thing to do, why, is, why are employers and trustees going to do it? Um, so, you know, do, do you see that the government's going to have to dumb down some of the regulatory regime, Steve, to make it easier for schemes to do, to move to CDC? Because if it's just too bloody hard, excuse the French, if it's too hard, then it's going to fall over before it starts, isn't it? Yeah, I guess the Royal Mail, bless them, have done a lot of the heavy lifting, though. I think that whole process means that most of the issues, I mean, obviously multi-employer CDC is different to single employer, but a lot of the same issues arise. So I think a lot of the pain has been done. The framework is kind of understood. And yes, you know, uh, you don't enter into this kind of thing lightly, but if it allows you to, to leave DB and you've decided to leave DB and still feel you're offering something good, there is a prize there. And once multi-employer is available, then just being an additional employer into that is, is, is straightforward for the employer. So yeah, I don't think they'll dumb it down. I think there's too much, you know, uh, Bryn Davis and his colleagues in the Lords will have a good look at anything that looks a bit dodgy on, you know, uh, different generations losing out and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so I don't think they'll get away with dumbing it down. But I think there's enough employers with enough, um, you know, paternalistic employers, basically, who might be interested. OK, fair, fair, fair comment. Uh, Chris, you got your hand raised. Chris Bumford, you want to unmute, Chris? Oh, I think maybe Chris is frozen. <laughs> Martin, you got your hand raised. Can you unmute Martin? Yeah, um, no, just a couple of other thoughts. The, uh, um, sorry, I had some technical issues earlier. I'll have to watch the recording for the bit I missed. But there was um, something launched earlier in June, I think, where DWP said it was going to be looking at the transfer regulations. How does that tie in with the proposed solutions on small pots? Um, so, because are you referring to sort of the anti-scam transfer mm. regulations and all that? Yeah. I mean, presumably, the argument would be uh, you immediately whitelist a default consolidator. I mean, you know, mm. it would be very weird for the government to say, oh, you know, trustees, you've got to be really, really careful about where you transfer to if there's this heavily government regulated central <laughs> consolidator vehicle. I think if the government said, looks a bit dodgy, that would... <laughs> be problematic really so i imagine they'll just say to providers just white lists for consolidators but certainly in the small pots documentation i couldn't see any mention about no. the existing transfer rules yeah. which yeah i think it would be it would be statutory you, mm. you would it would be a legal duty on the seeding scheme to shove the pot off to the consolidator mm -hmm. then they'd have any choice in the matter unless the member opted out okay thanks steve uh peter you've got your hand raised and then I'm surprised that Con Keating hasn't got his hand raised, but maybe Con, we'll save the, the best till last, I guess, Con. But anyway, go on, Peter, you go first. Yes, uh, good morning, Steve, and good morning, everybody else. Um, and incidentally, although you, um, I was noticed when watching the speech last night that you got a particular thank you from the Chancellor. So, uh, um, well spotted. <laughs> yes. um, but on, uh, going on to the PPF 100%. Um, yeah. Uh, of scheme benefits. I think the um, a lot of the issues with in the DB environment at the present time would be addressed by making that the default that um, one hundred percent, not just for the large schemes, um, because um, um, far too often the decisions are taken to say 
well, we've got to buy out because that's the only way we can ensure the members' benefits are protected at their current level. And therefore, uh, issues to do with uh, even ESG investing, as somebody's pointed out, uh, as um, uh, all these sort of things disappear and consolidation in particular becomes much more attractive if you retain the 100% PPF in the background, not as an objective, but as a, as a security to the members, then you can say to them, look, you're still protected at 100%, even though your current employer is no longer in the frame. Um, no, it's a, and, that's an interesting uh, one, P Peter. Um, I certainly think, I mean, the, the PPF has this rather pleasant problem of essentially a surplus and wondering what to do about it. And inevitably, the, the CBI and uh, the employers have a view as to what should happen to it. The, my dad's a 92-year-old PPF pensioner, and all his service, your maths will tell you, was pre-97. So he had a freeze on his pension this April. Well, I think you know my dad might feel that uh, he could find, uh, find, find somewhere for a bit of that surplus to go. So I think if I was the government, I'd be saying to the PPF, look, don't sit on this surplus, put some of it into enhanced PPF cover, PPF benefits. Uh, so I think that's that's certainly an option. Would I go to just 100% for everybody? I mean, I don't know what the maths are, whether the surplus would, would run to that. My worry is that in, so in our world, we have still a risk-based levy. So the, the DB scheme can take more risk but there's a limit to how much risk they're willing to take because the sponsoring employer is on the hook for a risk-based levy for that, well, for the whole thing, but for the final slice. Whereas if you just said, well, it's 100% cover, you know, whatever you do, then maybe there'd be just too much risk place. You know. so I, but I certainly think there's a case for increasing uh, PPF uh, cover levels. I saw Steve, my former colleague, Chris Bunford, had reconnected. I don't know whether he's able to unmute. Uh, Chris, are you now on and is your Wi-Fi able to unmute you? Maybe not. Worth, worth a try. <laughs> worth a try. OK, shall we come to Con Keating? Con, do you want to say a few words on what did you think about the Mansion House speech? Because I'm sure you've got an opinion, Con. If you could unmute. I'm you mute that on my Teams layout, so I couldn't find the unmute button. Um, well, um, Mansion House speech, wishful thinking. Um, the couple of couple of points. Um, I think it's absolute insanity to be putting venture capital into DC parts um, at the scheme level. The distributions are unbelievably nasty. Um, I'm also really surprised that anyone should seriously consider giving the British Business Bank a role in this, given their track record for really picking successes. Um, and I'll just offer Steve a couple of comments or a couple of sets of figures on increasing PPF benefits, as I have done the work on this. To exist the benefits, to upgrade the benefits of the existing members would cost between four and five billion pounds. Uh, so that can be easily afforded. Um, the cost of upgrading benefits going forward is really quite modest. Um, it's about 12%, 12.3% was the number that I arrived at, looking at the universe and what had been achieved uh, previously. Sorry, Con, 12.3% um, of what? 12.3% is the amount by which you'd have to increase the levy. Right. That's the amount of risk you increase by doing that. Okay. And that's allowing for the fact that the PPF charges close to twice what it should do for its premium for its levy. Um, it, it could be done, it should be done. It's quite clear. That's comments. Okay. Thanks, Con. So, Steve, um, Con suggesting insanity uh, with uh, with VC and uh, <laughs> um, and the uh, the PPS should half their levies, basically. So, yeah, what do you, what do you think about that? Well, I mean, the, the funny Thanks, thing Con. about the the funny thing about the PPF levy is, I suspect the PPF would have quite happily abolished it this year. 
um, but the law states that they can only increase the levy by 25% in any given year. So if it ever went to zero, they'd never be able to bring it back. And they have asked the DWP to change the law to allow them to bring it back if they abolished it. And the DWP said, look, you know, we've got 50,000 things we want to legislate for, and this is the 50,000 and first kind of thing. So part of the reason the PPF levy is, as Con says, more than it needs to be, is because they want, they just want an insurance policy because they can't unwind things if things turn badly suddenly. They don't have that that break. Uh, but, I, but I agree, I don't think they need to, to raise the levy that they're currently raising and they should have that flexibility. Uh, as I said, Con, I mean, I know we sat next to each other on a select committee and didn't entirely see eye to eye, but I, but I agree with you that PPF cover should be enhanced. I think financial assistance scheme cover as well. I know it's the poor Cinderella, but the FAS workers have had a pretty raw deal and a bit of surplus might go their way, in, in my view. Um, but it, it's interesting. I think, you know, we, we, we sat next to each other on a select committee and told the select committee two essentially different stories. And I think uh, I, I was the glass half full saying that, you know, we can argue about the details, but the PPF 7800 index was minus 400 billion seven years ago. It's plus 400 billion today. It's gone up again this morning by a few more billion. You know, something extraordinary is going on in pensions. And, you know, we may differ on the details, but, you know, surely we can put that money to better use. Um, I take the point we don't want to be absurdly risky and we need to look carefully at what we invest in. But, you know, to the extent I agree with the government in its agenda, I do think that there is some untapped potential here. And in my view, particularly in the DB world. So, um, I'd say I'm not a, not a cheerleader for the government, but, you know, at least they are tackling some of these things and trying to see if we can get, make better use of all this money that all worked so hard to get into pensions. Here, here. Thanks, Steve. That was a good comment. Uh, Henry, last question from you, and then I think we'll have to wrap up. But um, Henry, do you want to unmute? The uh, issue that the government have with DC is cost and the race to the bottom. Uh, has anything you've read, Steve, convinced you that there is something that can stop this race to the bottom with employers wanting to procure the lowest possible price and not include any form of uh, expensive assets in the investment mix? <coughs> to me. Um, I haven't studied the new VFM document this morning in detail, so it'd probably be slightly unfair if I was to, to dismiss it already. Yeah. I think the only challenge really, I mean, it's a bit like, you know, I said it's hard for the individual consumer to choose a pension. It's not particularly easy for an employer, is it really? And, you know, the only number the employer knows for sure is the charge. They don't know what the investment performance is going to be. The provider can't say to the employer, look, we've had fantastic investment returns for the last five years and we will do in the future because that would be illegal. So what's the employer got to go on? And that's why we do get this focus on on charges. Um, and I don't think there's an easy fix on that. You know, until firms are allowed to say, look, we consistently outperform others for, for these reasons. And that's a reason to choose us, even if we cost a bit more. Um, it is going to be a price driven market, I think. Um, and the current minister sort of says, oh, we've gone on about cost of charge for too long. We should look at value. But value, as she's discovering, is incredibly difficult to measure. And I don't I don't imagine they've cracked it yet. But maybe by tea time, I'll have read the document and concluded they have. Thank you very much. I Thank think much, yeah. I think that answers my question. <laughs> That's not a sentence I hear very often from you, Henry. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. Well, listen, uh, so Steve, thank you so much for uh, your input this morning. I think that's been a fantastic presentation. Thank lots you. and lots of everybody's, uh, lots of topics to cover and lots of subjects to uh, mull over. And um, let's hope some of it comes to some good, I guess. That's um, that's what we want. And um, really appreciate your input. Thanks everyone for your questions. Really, really appreciate that. Um, next week, we have Lloyd's Scottish Widows talking about um, uh, climate change and uh, good ESG investments. So um, please join us for that. If you're not a member of Playpen, please join. Um, and uh, as usual, we pray for peace in the East. Um, once again, Steve, really appreciate your time this morning. Fantastic opportunity to um, give us your thoughts, which have been fantastic. And uh, yeah, just thanks everyone for joining and I hope you enjoyed the session. It will be on our media tab this afternoon as a video recording. So if any of your colleagues have missed it and think it's great, which I think it's great, then please visit our media tab this afternoon and um, we will uh, we'll post it up there. So um, thanks everybody for your time today. Thanks for your questions and your input. You. Um, and uh, thanks to Sir Steve for, uh, for 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 the fantastic presentation. Lots of clapping coming through. Digital digital clapping, Steve. So um, 
There you go, which is good. So uh, you got you got mentioned at Mention House last night, and you've got digital claps on Pension Playpen. So it's My a great week. week. Is complete. <laughs> it's a great week.